these here are the cable adjusters on this Chinook for the brakes. You'll see there's one here and one on the other side. These are there to work my split brake handle that applies the brakes. And something I should tell you is these things have to be adjusted evenly so that when you put your hand around it, both of them, both of those cables down there are pulling evenly and are tightening at the same point. You don't want one of these to come way up higher than the other one does. Uh, there's adjusters here for it. Also, on the wheel, there's an adjuster here and a set screw in here that clamps on the cable so you can loosen this uh, set screw and push the cable further down into this little fitting I made here. Uh, the reason that's so important is because if one brake hits before the other one it can it can make you pull sideways off the runway. Uh, I don't know how they can get, become misadjusted other than somebody possibly damaging the cable by grabbing this and trying to lift the airplane by the cable here. You gotta watch it if you go to a, a fly-in or a pancake breakfast or something where there's a lot of kids around the plane or people that don't know what they're doing. Uh, they may actually try to pull on this cable for some reason and if they do that uh, it's gonna put you out of adjustment. The other tip I'll give you is back here, this little canister here is my expansion tank for the coolant in the radiator. When you pull the plane out to, to pre-flight it before you take off, you want to check make sure the coolant level is up in this little sight tube. You don't have to take any caps off or anything like that. You don't need to do that. Also, you never take off this cap on the radiator. It's lower than the engine. If you took that cap loose, a whole bunch of coolant would come out of there. So this cap is disabled. It doesn't, it's not a place to put coolant in or anything like that. Uh, it, it serves no purpose at all anymore other than to plug up that hole. Because this radiator, uh, it, it's all just uh, no pressure in it at all. It's fed by gravity from this. This tube right here is what keeps the coolant system filled. Uh, the coolant will run down here and when the engine is running you may see some coolant going up this hose and going back into this tank. It's always peeing in there a little bit of, of coolant going in there. That gets rid of any air bubbles or uh, gases that might develop in here. This can here will separate it so the, there's no possibility of getting steam or bubbles in there. Uh, this coolant expansion tank is as you can see a little bit bigger than the plastic ones. I didn't I tried doing it with plastic ones and flew around with a plastic one on there to start with but it really wasn't big enough and or durable enough. They crack. That's the other thing that happens to them. So I just put this metal metal tank on here. And that's what that's for. And this line, as long as you got coolant above that line when it's cold, you should be all right. When it when it gets hot, it'll go up fuller. It'll be up a little bit higher in there. It varies with the temperature. All right, this is the fuel filter here. You want to put a little inline filter in there. I usually change that every year in the spring. That filters the fuel before it goes into the fuel pump which is located here. Also you want to real keep a real close eye on this uh, pulse line. It's a real thick piece of, of like vinyl tubing but if they get old enough, if it gets to where you can't see through it like that, you should be able to see in it. Uh, it's getting too old and you should replace it and that I usually replace every year. Uh, that pulse line because it can get really old and fall apart just kind of go to crumbs on you so uh, you can use that kind of pulse line you might be able to use this kind of fuel line for that too that's pretty stiff stuff but it has to be something that won't collapse you don't want anything there collapsing on you uh, somebody was asking me 
about this rotary valve oil. There's a standpipe inside there, so there's only the hoses have to be hooked up in a specific way. You can't just stick them on there any which way. So this one uh, with the standpipe on it, which is this front one here, uh, that's the one that has a standpipe on, and that's the top one. That's where the air will come out. This second one is the bottom one. It goes down and hooks on to the lowest part of the engine. Now, this would be these connections would be reversed if you had the engine right side up, but this goes down to the lowest part of the engine. That's the best way to say it. So that that way you know whether it's right side up or upside down that the one without the standpipe goes to the bottom of the engine so that oil will flow down that one first and as it fills all the air is going to come out up here. There is a bleed screw for it for this space where the where the oil goes between the cylinders here there's a there's a bleed screw for it but normally you won't have to use that if you fill it with this this thing correctly you won't have any problem with that. And as far as using the oil the rotary valve oil may go down a little bit. Oh, well, I flew it what about 200 miles that last flight, and it's it's down about a quarter of an inch lower maybe than where it was when I started. Not much. It doesn't use very much. A cap full or of oil a flight would be about all that you're going to use out of there. Uh, I told you already about this yellow line. I think in one of the other videos you'll have to look at them, but that's. When I set it so that I can see this yellow line, there's two yellow lines on there, but if you can see one of those through one of these open holes, that means that the pistons are both setting uh, equally in inside the cylinders and that the transfer ports are closed so that you don't get a whole lot of oil draining into the, into the cylinders here. Uh, spark plugs, if you're using the normal plugs, you got to change them about every 20 hours, 25 hours maybe, the spark plugs. If you're using the thin wire platinum plugs, oh, it'll go a lot longer than that. Uh, maybe 100 hours I'll run those platinum plugs. Uh, they can be cleaned too if you have a blast cabinet, it's, it's easy to clean them. But, uh, but anyways, why... Uh, I guess that's about the only tips I can tell you back here. There's there's not much to do when you pre-flight other than to look at these uh, sockets here and and bend up, raise up and down on this, and look for cracks in this rubber. But these are good sockets. They're JBM sockets, and they don't really give you any problem with that. So they'll last a long time. But uh, but it's something to keep an eye on. You want to always watch your sockets. The original ones last maybe a year and then the rubber will crack and go bad on you. This device here is a temperature switch that's supposed to turn on a light on the uh, panel. If the temperature gets up to, I, I checked it on the stove, I think that switch closes at about 180 degrees. It, it's before it gets to 212, it's before boiling, and I think it's about 180 or 190 degrees, something like that, it's supposed to close and turn on a little panel warning light on the instrument panel. There's one on the front panel and the back panel. Okay, this is the gas cap. These gas caps fit, oh, lawn and garden equipment. You can get these at uh, probably any place that fixes riding lawnmowers or anything. They'll have caps like that. There's nothing odd about that. The cap is got a chain on there that chains it uh, to this uh, little uh, standoff tower here. Uh, that goes down into the gas tank. To remove this from the gas tank, you you have to take this tower out of there first before you can slide the tank out. You have to put a chain wrench around the uh, around this tower and unscrew it. It's normal right hand threads. It's a fine thread in there. But put uh, a little bit of blue Loctite or something on those threads when you screw it together, yeah, just so you don't get any oozing of of gasoline coming out around those threads. Uh, the other thing is when you're when you're traveling, I know this this is telling you about mixing with two cycle oil and stuff uh, and the fuel grade and everything. Uh, you have to remember that uh, in Europe the fuel grades are different than they are over here. 
and uh, people think they got to have high octane gas. Well, you don't. If you remember, the gas pumps uh, have a research octane by motor octane. You add the two together and, and divide by two. That's the formula. Uh, people from Europe come over here and say, oh, your gas is terrible octane. Well, it isn't. It's it's because of the way we measure it. But uh, don't use avgas in there except when you're traveling. You could fill it with avgas if you have to. But if you've got a preference, you want to put unleaded automobile gasoline in there, preferably 87 octane uh, gas to put in there because it's a two cycle. It doesn't have a whole lot of compression. But uh, but the av gas with the lead in it, the amount of lead in it, will carbon up the plugs very fast. You'll have a lot more trouble with fallen plugs and with piston rings sticking because the, the lead it, that's in the uh, aircraft fuel will combine with the two cycle oil and it, it builds carbon real fast. And that's what your enemy is, is carbon. So you have to take the uh, engine apart pretty fast if you do it that way. And I think another video I already explained that these are the fuel vents so that fuel doesn't has, has a, or air can get into the fuel tank but it uh, it also has a way to get out too when you're transferring fuel and filling it up. I think I explained how all that's supposed to work in another video. So uh, I don't know what else to tell you about it other than these bungee cords. I replace those maybe once every oh four four years, five years maybe I'll go with them. If you get two people in there and you find out that this wheel's, you know, going up pretty far, why? Uh, it probably needs a new bungee on there. And I put them on by wrapping them around with a tire iron. It's a big loop, 10 inches, fits a Taylor Craft uh, landing gear. They're pretty common. You can get them from Aircraft Spruce. And uh, it's just a big, big rubber band is what it is. And the other thing I did is up in here, it's kind of dirty. I don't know if you can see it. But that, in the end of this this tube here, this this down tube, this strut, that is a piece of urethane in there. They had like a piece of plastic or something. But this urethane, it's like what they use in urethane hammers and stuff. It's it's real tough stuff, and it goes up in there a ways. The, I I think either one bolt or maybe both bolts go through it. I can't remember. But uh, but that's the suspension stop, and like I say. This swing arm here is a piece of uh, aluminum that absolutely will not bend. It's it's a rigid piece of aluminum, and so therefore uh, its mode of failure would be to break. But it's almost impossible to break if you don't have a sharp edge uh, that it hits against. This is of course hitting on urethane, so it's not going to break there. And also that the the axles that the wheels turn on those are three quarter inch they're not those little five eighths things that most of these airplanes have and uh, there's nothing hard about taking them off there's a nut there it takes the wheel off